So what the hell is bacteriophage thermodynamics? You're probably wondering. And I, I have to admit I'm wondering to some extent myself. Thermodynamics is what I used to do before um, Maya found me. Uh, so <laughs> here's a layout of the talk. I won't assume that you're all thermodynamicists. I hope that comes as some relief. Um, but really what I would like to do is give you enough thermodynamics. You've seen it before maybe, but, but it, some cobwebs, well, do accumulate. So we'll try to knock those loose and give you a new perspective. And, and maybe the, the main point I'd like to get across is that um, this subject here, control thermodynamics, which is still mostly from the past millennium, as somebody called it recently, um, has quite a bit of relevance for doing theoretical biology. So let's uh, see where this goes. Um, OK, you got three laws. First one's conservation of energy. Any change in the energy of a system comes out as work or heat, which is not always so clear which one it is, and somewhat in the eyes of the beholder, but certainly one of those two. Um, heat flows from hot to cold, unless you put in work and pump it, but spontaneously. And uh, the third one is actually the least relevant for us, but, um, but you can't go below zero in an absolute sense. And um, the gambler's version is you can't win, you can't get energy from nowhere, you can't break even, you basically have to lose energy, as we'll see on the next slide, and you can't get out of the game. Um, so that's thermodynamics. Um, actually, this is still continuing, but this is probably not so much of a recap for you. Um, this is now sort of moving toward where the control thermodynamics uh, takes the subject. Um, okay, so energy was supposed to be work content. Uh, that didn't work out so well. I mean, it, it worked great for Newton, and, and the work energy theorem is wonderful, but um, but the inner conversion of heat sort of mucked it up. And uh, the fact that most systems aren't isolated, so they're in contact with something that's going to pass heat to and from. Uh, so that really caused sort of a, an unfortunate, well, change in nomenclature, right? It's not energy that's work content, it's free energy. And actually, if you drop the one temperature pressure, you probably want to call it exergy, but free energy is just fine for the purposes of this talk. Um, OK, so the work done on a system was the change in its free energy. Well, that's also oversimplifying a bit. If you really add friction or dissipation or make things, allow things to become irreversible, then uh, you don't actually get it all as work. I mean, potential work, but, but in fact, lots of it just turns into heat in your hands as you try to raise that weight or whatever, it, or convert to glucose or, I mean, chemical work or otherwise. Um, so dissipation, in some ways, is, is the central idea I want to talk to you about. And I think, as far as my reading of the biological literature, which is nowhere near exhaustive, although I got exhausted doing it, <laughs> um, it's been neglected far too much, okay? So it's generalized friction. And, and as I said, the work that you could have gotten but you don't get, so what happens to it? Well, it's responsible for choosing direction, which way things move and how fast they move. So rate and directionality are what we get out of that dissipation. And we have to pay it. I mean, if you uh, sort of look at, well, maybe I shouldn't have made it, allow, or made it round so it can roll, slide it. Or, I mean, this is not going to move. OK, fluctuations will make it move, especially on a, a microscopic scale, it will make it move. But not so I can rely on it going left to right. And if I'm a cell or, 
or a bacterium or even a phage, maybe. Um, then I need things to go the direction I need them to go or I'm not going to make it, right? So, so you have to lift one end and, and that result of it moving in the spontaneous direction will actually turn into heat. So I lose that as work. I have to put it in as work, it comes back out as heat. And I got the result I needed. Okay. So whether, okay, the, the other thing I wanted here was that uh, I can measure this dissipation as work or in work units or entropy units. It really makes no difference. There's this temperature of the environment factor that converts from one to the other. I needed to dissipate in order to, to get things to happen in a controlled fashion. So controlled thermodynamics is where I'm headed. But we're going to pause for an experiment. This is my only real contact to phage, I have to confess. But it's a great experiment. Um, totally ignored. And my tether. OK. Um, so you take some seawater. Well, we took aquarium water, but which actually the, the referees didn't like. But uh, OK, we took sea, uh, aquarium seawater. <laughs> And we filtered three different uh, samples out of it. Uh, one having only, well, I mean, they're, they're defined by the pore size of the filter. This was sterile, quote unquote, seawater. Uh, virus fraction or microbes, let's say bacteria. Um, and, and you can do the uh, calorimetry fairly carefully and easily and repeatably, although uh, coming from physics or chemistry, the, repeat of, the necessity to repeat experiments is not something you realize until the referees complain. Um, come on, you measured it once. Why should you measure it 100 times? It isn't going to change on you, is it? Anyway, it's 50 nanojoules. Um, yeah. On the other hand, whoops, if you add virus, something beautiful happens. And actually, uh, I think several speakers this afternoon referred to it. I'd have to look at my notes to see. Um, but I think it was Freda Thinkstad, actually, that, uh, that referred to the fact that I really increase the heat production. It's because they cycle. I make a bacterium, it breaks back down, I make it again, it breaks back down, I make it again. I mean, of course you increase the heat. Heat is measuring, well, I'm going to discuss that on the next slide. But, um, okay, so here's, you can, I mean, it's more or less the same mixture. All I do is autoclave the virus that go into one side. This is a differential calorimeter, so it can, it's really sensitive, right? Um, the conclusion is that phage are responsible for more than half of the heat that's produced there. Um, and I, uh, the top-down control is also visible. I produce fewer net bacteria. Of course, I produced far more bacteria, but they got eaten again. So the net bacterial production goes down which, again, is in, in agreement with what we heard from Freda. Um, OK, so what did the heat tell us? The heat told us how much free energy is needed to um, build, digest, rebuild the bacteria at their natural growth rate, or at the rate at which these reactions happen. OK. Um, and the friction here looks like that, that mu is supposed to be chemical potential, just to take you back to p-chem class for a second. The dn is the differential number of moles that went across that chemical potential difference. And the standard bioenergetics books, I'm sorry, maybe I haven't read the better new ones, but they never count the wasted stuff, the heat produced. You take it as equilibrium free energies. Bad idea. Um, OK, so now I'm ready for control thermodynamics. 
Um, although this first, slide, uh, uh, first line belies that a little bit. This is traditional thermodynamics. It, it gives limits to possible control of a physical chemical system given, it, it's a comparative statics theory. There's no dynamics there. It doesn't tell you how fast, it just tells you what happens. Given this start, this end, could it have happened? How much work could have gotten, been gotten out of it, et cetera. But I'm gonna change this a little and here's where the 20th century, even second half of the 20th century comes in. You add one more net effect. How much time elapsed? Not dynamic still, still comparative statics, but just what can you do in a given time? And then actually you get sort of, uh, I mean, this is supposed to, this axis is supposed to sort of represent any old parameter, any knob I have on the system. And then there's two sort of interesting spots, the maximum power, minimum dissipation. And there's stuff outside of there, but you never want to be there. The interesting region is the green part, in between those two. Okay. Um, the endpoints, the maximum power and the minimum entropy production, are both quite interesting. More than the green stuff in between, unless you're an economist. Um, and the relevance here, that control is selection, or selection is control, or I guess I wanted it in that order, yeah. Um, so just what limits there are to controlling such systems is of biological relevance. In fact, I would say paramount. Um, okay, so here's one place. It's generally acknowledged. It's a folk theorem, as far as I can tell. Um, and I first met it actually at the ISME in Copenhagen that I got dragged to or allowed to go to um, with Tom Schmidt's uh, talk. And in fact, these pictures, well, it's not the exact pictures, but he had a red sports car and a Vespa. I had been uh, sort of showing the scale since 1983 is I think when we published it. but. Um, but never with a red sports car and a little Vespa. That was sexy, so I stole it. <laughs> um, okay, so the idea is that when I sort of start with a clear-cut ecosystem, what happens? The fast guys move in, right? The maximum power. They're the colonizers. Um, and then as the ecosystem matures, I sort of get more and more slow and efficient. Now how this relates to the strains that, uh, that we heard about earlier this afternoon, I would dearly love to understand and yeah. Um, I don't think Freda gets an exit visa from this country until he's finished that problem. <laughs> um, okay, but uh, some of the control thermodynamic theorems do apply here. So the, the main theorem for the maximum power end, and I'm simplifying a little, but not much, um, is that to get maximum power, you have to throw away half the work, half the potential work. That's the lowest term in the Taylor series. If you know what those are, if not, ignore it. it it's roughly half, okay? And it's a nice universal result, okay? Um, just to show you that this is actually quite unappreciated, um, so recent technology has given us whole cell simulations. I just spent a few weeks at, in Mark Covert's lab at Stanford trying to learn how they do all this. And, and they're really proud of the fact that they count every molecule or so they claim. They lose a few waters. But, but they claim to count every molecule. On the other hand, 44% of the energy they can't account for. All you have to do is look at this theorem. It's done. What more to say? It would be 50 exactly if you were at maximum power. You aren't. Uh, it's... <laughs> okay. Um, I'd also like to say a little bit about the other end. I hope my time is holding up. Uh, but, uh, but that one's more complicated. So let's spend a whole slide on it. So minimum dissipation. Um, I sort of think about as a horse carrot process. You're trying to coax the system sort of with minimal losses. So you, oh, 
<laughs> All right, maybe we don't go into that much detail. You can get the picture just from the picture, <laughs> or at least hopefully. Uh, the environment is just a little bit ahead of where the system is, and so I never have very strong temperature differences, pressure differences, chemical potential differences, and I keep moving it. Um, and I can actually get that to get at least a physical chemical system, which is the only kind I thought about before Maya's evil influence. Um, I mean, you can traverse, get a system to traverse any path in its state space. And then the result is that the minimum dissipation is the distance you're trying to make the system go. And that distance is a thermodynamic distance. It's what has kept this from being more widely appreciated. It's technical. Um, yeah, and k is the number of steps you go. And if you can go continuously, the result looks almost the same. It's the number of equilibrations. Um, and to understand that, think about heating a cup of coffee. We used to talk about a coffee cup motel. So take a, a big hotel and set the thermostat in each room just a little hotter. So you start off at room temperature and by the end, you're in a really hot room. But each room just heats up just a little. Take the coffee, every day move it to the next room. And then by the end, when you've gotten it into the hot room, um, you've actually heated it up with almost no loss of work, no dissipation. Okay, so here's, um, uh, so this actually, um, yeah, how do I say this quickly? Um, so that's a fairly old theorem. Uh, a, a colleague of mine that was visiting San Diego on a sabbatical, uh, actually calculated the distances in going from between the different cytochromes and the, the electron transport chain, right? And he was giving this talk um, and actually seemed to catch Forrest's attention. And then he was gone all fall, and then when he comes back, he has this great idea, which I think is, is sort of predicated on it. And it said, if I need to go from A to B, but I break it up, I don't have to go in equal increments, which that theorem had, because that's the, the minimum way to actually achieve that L squared over 2K bound. But as long as I go and, and put in an extra rung, I'll get less dissipation. OK, so I'm going to call it the ladder theorem, because it needs a proof, clearly. And it needs sort of the, the right assumptions and, and frame, just, yeah. Um, and we know that Forrest always likes to worry about these kind of details like hell. Um, OK. <clears throat> and on that note, uh, there's a couple of examples. The electron transport certainly is one of them. Trophic chains in an ecosystem is another. And I'll remind you of what I talked about, and I'm done. Convex and concave affected? Um, oh, well, oh, I can't start it from here, can I? That was silly ending it. I, I knew it was the last slide. I... Yeah, okay. Yeah, so this is what you're talking about? Yeah. Um, so I'm, this is convex. If that statement is true, that's a statement of convexity. That usually compares how you do in between two points, right? So if I just stick in something in between, it, it pulls the whole thing down. And yeah, it, it affects it. it. It's needed. On the other hand, what makes C in between A and B? That's a much harder question. And that's what I meant by the details that I know that Forrest is not going to help me with. Yes, it is. So if I go back, oops, nah, come on. Yeah, well, no, here. In order to get that minimum, each of the steps has to be equidistant. So that's the symmetry is better. That's how you do the minimum. Yeah. That was your, yes. OK, good. OK. Oh. Uh, could you 
tell us exactly how you do the, the calorimetry experiment? I'm trying to imagine <laughs> what I'm doing with calorimeter and, and uh -oh. the bacterial function. I mean, you got to bubble oxygen in, things like this. That's I'm really cool. happy to say that the experimentalist in charge of that, who didn't believe in doing it a hundred times, um, is here. And maybe, I, how did we do the experiment? Well... So, I mean, first of all, I thought you were just doing a, a, a you know, enthalpy of dilution, but, but you've got the growing no, culture. No, no, no. You've got a growing culture. Right? Growing culture. Which means you have to have inputs of oxygen and bubbling and temperature change. And nah. Like a <laughs> so these ran about 20 hours. I guess you can, well, if your eyes are really good, you can see that here. I mean, that goes 24 hours. Um, they're done inside huge 55-gallon drums of water, basically, to, uh, to give them good thermal inertia. They're little 20 mil, right? I mean, you can see 16 plus 3 plus 1. That's usually 20. Um, little, what are those called? Cuvettes. Yeah. Okay, good. Thank you. Um, and then you, uh, so there's not that much, I, I don't know. I, I don't think I should touch it further. I'm a theorist, you know. I'm in a math department. I'm not licensed to do this crap. Right? <laughs> 